नमस्ते एवरी वन वेलकम टू दिस एडिशन ऑफ स्टेट ऑफ द डिसिप्लिन सीरीज प्रेजेंटेड बाय द सेंटर फॉर सिविलाइजेशन स्टडीज रिश्यूट यूनिवर्सिटी आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर सी जी दत्ता टू प्लीज कम टू द डाइस एंड बिगिन द प्रोसीडिंग्स ऑफ द टूडेज इवेंट एंड आई विल रिक्वेस्ट प्लीज कीप योर फोन स्विस्ट ऑफ थैंक यू thank you so much shorab i'm delighted to welcome all of you to yet another edition of uh, our center's lecture series uh, which we are calling the state of the discipline and uh, today we are going to uh, discuss with the help of uh, a presentation by a very uh, eminent scholar uh, the state of the discipline of education focusing on the history of education uh, so in order to do that i have the pleasure of uh, welcoming and introducing dr ankur kakkar who is an assistant professor at the center for indic studies indus university ahmedabad where he teaches courses on indian history and indian knowledge systems he is also the editor of indic vartha the electronic magazine published by the center for indic studies in this university dr kakkar is interested in the deeper civilizational aspects and continuities in indian history and culture and his research work focuses on these aspects he received his doctorate in history from the south asia institute university of heidelberg germany His doctoral dissertation entitled The Dayanand Anglo Vedic School of Lahore A Study of Education Reform in Colonial Punjab between 1880 to 1920 was supervised by Professor Geeta Dharampal daughter of eminent historian Sri Dharampal Dr Kakkar's PhD dissertation highlighted the continuities between pre-colonial pathshalas or indigenous village schools and educational institutions established by nationalists in particular in the 19th and 20th centuries his dissertation documented the history of one of the most significant reformist educational enterprises in colonial india namely the dayanand anglo vedic or dav movement dr kakkar has authored various articles on european surveys of indian knowledge systems ankur also holds a postgraduate degree in history from the school of history classics and archaeology at the university of edinburgh united kingdom in february 2022 dr kakka was awarded a prestigious research fellowship from the motwani jadeja family foundation in palo alto usa to write a book manuscript on the history of education in modern india dr kakka i have once again the pleasure of welcoming you to rishihud university and thank you uh, very much for uh, agreeing to give this lecture over here and have a dialogue with us welcome sir namaste om shri gurubhyo namaha i would like to begin my lecture by thanking uh, shobhit mathur ji of uh, rishihud university and uh, uh, shrijit datta for having me here and for giving me this opportunity to speak on this important subject of uh, history of education basically when we talk about the history of education and the education policy it is a very vast topic so what i'll do is i'll start by discussing how this search for historical documents began why did we start searching about the history of education in india okay yes so i was mentioning about the fact that this when we talk about the discipline of the history of education it's a vast subject it's a vast area uh, because it covers a very vast period in terms of if you talk about historical period uh, right from the ancient time through to the modern time and uh, when we start discussing about it the first question that we often ask ourselves is uh, why are we discussing about the history of education why is this relevant and how to start uh, why did we start researching first of all about the history of education now let's start with the history of indian education and as i said the first question that comes to our mind is 
why should we study the history of indian education or why did it suddenly become important for us to look into this history so in 1931 there was a speech that was made by gandhi in london in which he said that india was more literate before the british came to india than it was at his time that was in 1931 and to uh, quote gandhi's words exactly he said i say without fear of my figures being challenged successfully that today india is more illiterate than it was a 50 or 100 years ago and so is burma because the british administrators when they came to india instead of taking hold of things as they were they began to root them out they scratched the soil and began to look at the root and left the root like that and the beautiful tree perished and then he says our state would revive the old village school master and dot every village with a school both for boys and girls so essentially what gandhi is saying is that india was more literate before the british came to india and before they intervened and uprooted the beautiful tree the beautiful tree is here a metaphor for the education system that flourished in india before the arrival of the british now this court and these remarks by gandhi were very controversial at that time because at that time it was believed that the british introduced education in india and they civilized the indians so for someone to say that india was more educated before the british had come was quite a controversial remark especially during those times and this was taken up very seriously by the british authorities they argued against it they contested this statement uh especially because it was made by a person of having a high profile such as gandhi and also it was made in london so it had an impact and because it had an impact uh, the british were very uh anxious about what the kind of impact that the statement had and then there were reactions to it for example uh, there was a person named sir philip hartog who countered gandhi ji statements and he said no this is not true and uh, these figures can be challenged and all that uh, but nevertheless this statement sparked a controversy and this controversy was taken up by a man called dharampal dharampal ji was influenced by gandhi ji and he took up this task of undertaking research into this historical inquiry of indian education because he firmly believed that gandhi ji had some basis when he was saying that india was more educated before the british came so what dharampal ji did was he started compiling evidence in favor of the statement he started compiling data that he could use to substantiate gandhi ji statements because at that time there was little evidence in terms of objective data to prove gandhi ji statement so dharampal ji started compiling hard data evidence statistics and all different kinds of evidence to prove gandhi ji statement he spent a lot of time in london dharampal ji spent a lot of time in london started compiling different documents he went through a whole range of archives that were housed at that time in the british library in london and from those colonial archives he managed to get a large amount of documentation that talked about the state of education in india before the british came and also when the british arrived in india so what dharampal ji did was he looked at these surveys the surveys of indian education that were conducted by the british themselves when they came to india so when the british landed in india they first started taking a survey they undertook a survey of the existing state of education in india and to understand what was the kind of you know uh, native education system and what was the kind of learning that the people themselves were giving and also to understand how the british themselves could reform that state so surprisingly through these documents through these surveys of colon of uh, indigenous education that the british conducted dharampal ji found very interesting 
uh, statistics and very interesting information. All of this was compiled in a book that Dharampal ji published in 1983 and this book was titled The Beautiful Tree. It was titled The Beautiful Tree because he wanted to pay a tribute to Gandhiji who used this term for the first time, The Beautiful Tree. This book, The Beautiful Tree, is a compilation of the various documents that Dharampal ji had collected as evidence to support Gandhiji's statement that India was more educated before the British came. Now, I'll give you an overview of what these documents contain. First of all, these documents tell us that when the British came to India, there, were, there was a vast network of partshalas in India, a very vast and extensive network of partshalas. In fact, so much so that every school, every village had a partshala. Every village in India had a partshala. In fact, there was this famous survey conducted by a man called William Adam in 1835 and then two more surveys, three more surveys in 1838 in which he said that there are 100,000 partshalas in Bengal alone. There were at that time around 100,000 villages in Bengal. So one could assume that there was a village, a partshala in every village because as many villages, that many partshalas. Also, the surveys that uh, Dharampal ji con compiled showed that the, the quality of education that was given in these partshalas, in these indigenous partshalas, was better than the contemporary education that was given in England at that time. In what sense? It was better in the sense that the content was broader. The duration of study was longer. That means a student normally spent more number of years in Indian partshalas than his contemporaries would spend in England. The methods of teaching were superior. In fact, some of the methods were so superior that they were borrowed from India and then taken to England. For example, the monitorial system. The fact that you would have a monitor in a school is called the monitorial system and that as we know, it's now very well documented that this was taken from Madras and then uh, to England and then it revolutionized mass education system in England. The school environment in India was far less dingy and was more natural as compared to the England schools and the teachers were more dedicated and sober. And these facts were documented not by Indians, but by the British themselves, because the British were conducting these surveys. So all this information that Dharampal ji was showing was contained in the colonial surveys. Then Dharampal ji found out from these surveys that the schools, these partshalas were very economical. For example, one school would be conducted by only one teacher. This is very surprising today because we have so many teachers in one single school. But at that time, only one teacher was managing one school. Uh, the reason was that, as I said, there were monitors and then senior students would be appointed to manage junior students. So only one teacher was managing the whole school. Then students would begin by writing on sand and on palm leaves. So it was very economical. There was no, this, there was not just so much paraphernalia on and all this infrastructure. Um, there were several other features like integrated learning, multi-dimensional learning. The students learned alphabets through memorization of verses that would rhyme. And these verses were also not only teaching them alphabet or language, but also included moral and religious precepts. Uh, there are many examples like that. For example, in um, there's one survey which was conducted by uh, G. W. Leitner in Punjab, uh, and his survey is called the History of Indigenous Education in Punjab, and he gives a list of all these different uh, uh, m uh, this rhymes, and he gives a list of all these uh, rhymes that were memorized and for example he says when you learn the alphabet so in hindi you learn ka, ka, ga, ga, ga. so for ka the rhyme that 
people used to the students used to learn was k k se kakka and then they say k kakka kar karta ki puja wahi niranjan aur na duja k se kakka kakka kar karta ki puja wahi niranjan aur na duja so using such rhymes students would memorize not only the alphabet but they would also internalize the moral and religious and cultural message that was embedded in these rhymes it is a very interesting way of memorizing alphabets so it was a very integrated learning and once they memorized the alphabet then they would be taught to write the alphabet also so reading and writing was simultaneous it was not segregated it was not separate it was not that you have a separate class for uh, learning alphabet and reading and you have a separate class for writing in which nowadays you have uh, you know you can write on copies that was not the case you would learn the alphabet memorize the alphabet and then write that same alphabet on sand so you were, if you have to write k you will write k on sand because the sound of the alphabet is connected also to the script and when you right so you have you have that connection finally dhanampal ji found out from the surveys that the financing and the maintenance of these patshalas was not done by any centralized agency there was no central agency that was funding these institutions like we have today we have so many central agencies like uh, you know the central education board and all that but indigenous patshalas were not funded by a central agency they were funded by local communities and they were given rent free lands where the tax was not uh, uh, taken from them for those lands where the patshalas were constructed and what were the subjects taught in the patshalas uh, a very wide range of subjects were taught uh, in the elementary patshalas reading writing arithmetic was of course a very fundamental feature of every patshala basic reading writing arithmetic was taught to students uh, besides this they were you will be surprised to know that all the schools throughout india whether it was in north india or in south india or east or west they were all taught different texts and according to their you know regional and cultural uh, setup but there were three texts that were common across the length and breadth of india and these were the ramayan mahabharat and bhagavat puran the ramayan Mah- mahabharat and bhagavat puran were common and they were taught in all schools throughout india and we will be surprised to know because today when we talk about introducing mahabharat or introducing ramayan in schools there is such a big controversy and people say that okay you know you are being communal and all that but this was very common in india in the 19th century then there were different subjects for people belonging to different classes and different professions for example if you wanted to be a shopkeeper you would be taught accounts that would be useful for your profession if you wanted to keep books for traders account keeping book keeping uh for farmers who be taught agriculture units that would be useful for their profession so every person was taught according to their line of work so there were different patshalas according to the line of work then there was vocational training in the sense vocational training is a modern term but to use the uh to i mean to explain it in a broader sense there was apprenticeship for people who wanted to be artisans there were guilds and they could work under a person who was trained in that art so for example if you wanted to learn carpentry you could work you could go to a workshop of a carpenter and learn carpentry uh, if you wanted to learn uh, if you wanted to be a goldsmith or you wanted to be a potter you could go to a workshop of a potter and stay with them and learn and this is like an apprenticeship so something we can today we can call apprenticeship or vocational training so it was skill based training so these patshalas were mostly in the houses and the workshops of the artisans and then the students used to go and learn from them and that was how this education was given for a higher learning there were different kinds of gurukuls different kinds of uh, various kinds of gurukuls depending on the kind of subject that you want to study so uh 
if you want to study the Veda and Vedang, then never you have to go to a different guru. If you want to study philosophy, law, logic, and different subjects, then there were different kinds of gurukuls specially dedicated for these subjects. So this was an overview of the kind of information that Dharampal ji compiled from the surveys on indigenous education in the 19th century. And this picture that emerges from these surveys is a very interesting picture because it shows us that not only was there an extensive and large network of Patshalas and schools in India when the British came, but also that it was rich in content and every person in society was able to get the education for the role that he had to fulfill in society. So in a village, for example, if somebody wants to be a goldsmith, they could get education for a goldsmith. If somebody wanted to be a farmer, they could get education for a farmer. So the larger picture that emerges from these surveys that Dharampal ji compiled is the fact that education was given at that time for fulfillment of your role in society. There was no lack of skills, no lack of centers, no lack of partshalas. If you wanted to learn something for a skill that you wanted to fulfill in the society. Which means that societies were self-sufficient. The villages were self-sufficient. They had the partshalas, they had the gurukuls, they had the necessary teaching uh, system in place for developing the individuals to fulfill their functions in the society. Now, once we have understood this picture of indigenous education in the 19th century before the British came, one asks the, the natural question, the next question that one asks oneself is, then what about the ancient education? If the education system in the 19th century was itself so uh, flourishing, then what about the ancient education system, which probably would be even richer in content because uh, then it was not impacted by invasions and uh, uh, all these years of decay. Because you see, when Dharampal ji uh, compiled these surveys, these surveys were conducted at a time when these institu institutions were already in decay. At that time, these partshalas and these network of indigenous education was already declining because they did not have enough resources. So, if this was the state of education when it was in decline, then what would have been the state of education when there was no decline and then when there was no invasion. So that takes us to the question of the state of ancient Indian education. So let us go back in history to the state of ancient education. When we talk about ancient Indian education, the first question that comes to our mind is, what is Indian education or what characterizes Indian education? So every civilization has some unique characteristics that define the kind of education, the kind of economy, the kind of society that flourish in that civilization. When you, when, when you ask yourself what is unique about Indian education, you are also asking what is unique about Indian civilization and about the way that you look at, at humans in general. So, because of the peculiarity of Indian civilization, in the sense that we have, there was an emphasis on the spiritual development of the self, and the ultimate knowledge was considered to be the knowledge of the self, that feature of Indian civilization impacted every domain of society, whether it was education or it was polity or it was economy. In education, this, this emphasis on spirit as the true shaping reality of man, this gave Indian education a, a color that was unique in itself. So if somebody asks you what is unique about Indian education, the starting point is that the emphasis is on the spiritual development of the self, which was not found in other education systems at that time. Now, how does this translate into practice and what does this mean for our pedagogy and for our methods of teaching? So, when, we, when the ancient Indian education thinkers, when they started conceiving this system, 
they had in mind that the purpose of education first of all the fundamental purpose is to strengthen our instruments of learning the fundamental purpose of education when you define education what do you define as the fundamental purpose it is not to acquire so much so much information the fundamental purpose of education as ancient indian thinkers conceived it was to strengthen your instruments of learning the instruments of learning are body and mind and nerves and vitality so when you strengthen your instruments of learning then you can acquire information and you can know how to use that information properly so to see and hear better desire better purer finer and deeper to form and mold the mind which receives processes and analyzes all information so this was i think a very fundamental aspect of the purpose of indian education because unless you purify the instrument of learning you cannot do much if you don't have that that purity in the instrument itself like for example if you have a pot and in the pot you want to pour ghee now if the pot is let's say it is dirty or it is broken or it is impure then no matter how much ghee you pour into it when you will take out it will be impure how no matter how large that pot is or how much volume of ghee you pour into that pot so similarly the pot is like the mind so unless the mind itself is pure and the mind itself is when i say pure i mean in terms of uh this uh i mean from a spiritual point of view from the fact that uh, there are uh, it is it's it's the the consciousness is pure so you can perceive things clearly so when the mind is pure then the information that is received is received as it is you are able to see things as they are you are able to analyze things as they are you are able to process things as they are the information comes unfiltered to the mind and the mind processes them unfiltered otherwise what happens is if the mind is not pure the information that is given to the mind is becomes filtered information and the output is also filtered output so you don't achieve the desired results and then there is confusion and lack of clarity and you know lack of desired objectives so this emphasis on the purity of the instrument was given in indian education right from the beginning itself because it was understood that only with a pure mind you can do anything any work you can do only if the mind is pure so first you have to purify the instrument of learning then you will be able to learn or teach if you acquire any information it will only be acquired properly if the mind and instrument is clear and ultimately the purpose of education was yoga and which is chitta vritti nirodha which means suspension of mental activities uh in the consciousness at the level of the consciousness to you know purify the consciousness another important feature of indian education was that education was a matter of the whole life it was not about going to school in the morning and coming back in the evening and then having your separate uh, private life or going to college in the morning and coming back and having your own private life or even graduating from school and college and then having your own individual life that was not the kind of education that was envisioned by indian thinkers ancient indian education was controlled life in its totality so the whole the education was for the whole of life it was not for just a part of your life or just a part of your day the very character and the life and the tenor of the pupil was changed after going through this education system the home was the home of the guru he would learn everything in that home so when he would come out of the gurukul the whole character and the nature of the pupil would be transformed this is just a picture of gurukuls <laughs> so you can see that 
the atmosphere is very tranquil and serene and the uh, students are learning in front of the guru this is a very common picture in india you can find it still in so many gurukuls if you visit them and also it is common to find this in so many in the depictions of gurukuls in literature in common literature also in even in popular literature you can find these depictions now i come to the importance of education that was given in india because some people think that maybe indians did not give so much importance to education at least in the ancient times but this was not so this is a quote from a british official his name was alexander walker and this is again compiled by dharampal ji alexander walker in the 18th century he was visiting india he was he was appointed in india and he wrote that no people probably appreciate more justly the importance of instructions than the hindus they sacrifice all the feelings of wealth family pride and caste that their children may have the advantage of good education native free schools were once universal throughout india and he is writing this in the 18th century at the time when indian education was already on the decline so imagine what would have been the state when there was no invasion so this is a myth that indians did not give importance to education before the british came and only now we have started giving importance through all these different kind of you know abhyans that we are having <laughs> because we have been an education driven society right from the dawn of our civilization india has been a knowledge centered civilization so we have given importance to education right from the dawn of civilization this is evident from the fact that the importance of the guru shishya parampara is found in so many texts throughout our literature so it is elaborately explained in the smritis in dharma shastras such as manusmriti yagnavalkya smriti kautilya's arth shastra describes in detail about the education of a prince there are so many texts in fact there are endless texts you pick out any text of sanskrit literature whether it is the Kad kadambari or it is the even the uh, kamsutra of vatsyayan talks about the education uh the ramayan of course talks about various ashrams the for most famous ashram is the ashram of rishi bharadwaj the mahabharat talks about the ashram of rishi shonak with 10000 pupils so the fact that every literature in sanskrit talks about the education system and has reference to the guru shishya parampara is itself a testimony to the fact that the importance of education that was given in india throughout millennia now i'll come to different features of what this education system had like this ancient education system had so many different features one of them was manual work the house of the teacher was known as the ashram or gurukul the teacher accepted a student and made him a member of his family there was no fixed fees the students had to serve the teacher beg for food collect fuel and do other chores which were assigned to him life in a gurukul was simple and the brahmacharins were taught to work hard without self interest the student had to serve his teacher wholeheartedly so this is an example a quote from kapil kapoor ji's uh, a book on the encyclopedia of hinduism and this he, he refers to this uh, feature of manual work in a patshala or gurukul then there is another quote from rk mukherjee's famous work on ancient indian education in which he says the pupil is to fetch firewood out of the forest without damaging the trees and before sunset the fuel thus fetched daily from the forest is to be placed on the floor of the teacher's house after having kindled the fire and swept the ground around the altar the vedi the pupil is to place that sacred fuel on the fire every morning and evening he shall sweep the place around the fire after it has been made to burn with his hand and not with the broom 
but before adding the fuel he is to free to he is free to use the broom at his pleasure besides fe fetching fuel and tending the fire twice daily the pupil was to fetch water in a vessel for the use of his teacher both in the morning and evening can you imagine any student can do this today you have to fetch water you have to fetch fuel you have to fetch uh, wood every day for the rituals of that place so imagine the kind of hard work and the kind of manual work that was required as part of the education system in those days another feature of ancient education system was bhiksha the students had to go begging for food it is not begging in the sense that we understand today in the sense that they It, the, the, this whole feature of bhiksha was to inculcate a sense of humility in the students and also to teach them that this the the, the resources that you're getting are coming from the community themselves it is not free resources right now in the current education system most of the students don't know from where the resources are coming they have no connect with the community or with the local community at which they are living in which they are living but this was not the case earlier in fact uh, begging was enjoined as a measure of discipline for its educative value and it was not a compulsory daily duty bodhayana in his dharma sutras points out the virtues of begging that by this the student makes himself poor and humble in spirit it was thus valued as a method of moral discipline another feature of the ancient education system was equality and simplicity studies were chosen freely and not uh, according to caste uh, we read of brahman students learning different subjects at takshila uh, and settling down as hunters in the forests of banaras then we have princes at school who had to share a common simple democratic life of equality with their poorer comrades the food of the boys at school was very simple rice gruel was served for breakfast by the maid of the teacher's house while only at invitations they were given a meal of sugar cane molasses and curd and milk so the whole lifestyle was very simple and there was equality in the sense that there was no discrimination between a rich student coming from a rich background and a poor student when you see the ramayan also you if you see the popular version of the ramayan that is the uh, that was produced by raman and sagar uh in that if you see episode third episode in which he depicts the uh, ashram that uh, that is there you know that uh, is is uh, shri ram and uh, lakshman and everybody is studying in that ashram and you will see the same thing that everybody is on an equal footing there is no discrimination between somebody who is coming from a royal background or somebody who is coming from a poor background we also see this in the mahabharat in the story of krishna and sudama so there was no discrimination between a rich student and a poor student and also there was uh, simplicity in the lifestyle that they were used to today it was very difficult for us to imagine like that you can tell from uh, the school that a boy is going to about uh, how much his father's income must be <laughs> i want to tell a very interesting story of jivak jivak was a physician in ancient india and jivak was a physician to magad emperor the magad emperor's name was bimbisar now jivak's story is interesting because it captures the essence of indian education jivak was a physician he did not know uh, nobody knows where he came from his origins are obscure some say he was found in a dust heap and he was rescued by bimbisar's son just imagine कूड़े के ढेर में कोई बच्चा था एंड उसको एक प्रिंस ने उठा लिया एंड ही केम एंड ही टर्न आउट टू बी वन ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट फिजिशियंस इन एंशियंट इंडिया सो ही स्टडीड मेडिसिन एट तक्षशिला फॉर सेवन इयर्स देन ही वॉज एग्जामिंड बाय हिज टीचर एंड द एग्जामिनेशन वॉज दैट यू टेक अ स्पेड एंड यू गो अराउंड तक्षशिला a yojan on every side and you wherever you see any any plant you study the plant and you tell me any plant 
in this entire region which is not medicinal or which does not have any medicinal value so after a good deal of investigation jivak comes back to his teacher and says that i have not found any plant which does not have any medicinal property and then his teacher says very good now that means you have passed the exam which means you know that every plant has some medicinal property you know about that medicinal property of every plant so the teacher gave him a little money and sent him home now the reason to tell this story was to tell that it captures the essence of an ancient education system that you could rise from humble origins education was valued knowledge was valued regardless of where you came from now i'll come to the 64 kalas in so many different texts of ancient indian literature uh whether it is the kadambari or the any any text that talk there are so many references to chausat kala chausat kala 64 kalas now there is no single list of 64 kalas because so many texts have different kalas so uh, there is no one single comprehensive list of exact 64 kalas but they, more or less they are overlapping so some texts will have maybe one or two kalas different from some other texts but more or less they are overlapping and what are these 64 kalas that we talk about all the time i'll give you a glimpse of what they are this is a list of what they are uh, it is difficult to read every kala in this list but i'll just give you some examples so the kala of dancing then there is this uh, kala of producing various forms out of stone wood and other materials then uh, uh, there is this kala of uh, grafting and planting and culture of plants there are different kinds of you should have the knowledge of combination of minerals and herbs there is this science of producing new compounds there is the art of adjusting the bow with the foot so all kinds of kalas are here in this list of 64 kalas the science of charioteering saryatham there is this uh, chitradi alekhanam the painting of pictures then there is ghattadi anyakantaram vadyanam kriti the construction of machines like the water wheel and musical instruments there are so many different kinds of kalas the jala vayu agni samyog nirodha kriya working with water fire and air in two ways by utilizing them or controlling them then there is a lepa di sakriti the art of enameling polishing watering varnish uh, sorry varnishing then there is this art of separating the hide and various limbs from the bodies of animals there is the art of the knowledge of processing milk and making ghee from milk it is this this is called dugda dugda dohadi krihatantam vigyanam so various kinds of arts are there there is the art of climbing trees also which is <laughs> in this list of arts there is the art of making vessels out of bamboo there is this art of manufacture of sandals various kinds of kalas that were there interestingly one kala which you'll find in this list is the art of managing children shishoha samrakshane dharane kriyane gyanam the art of bringing up handling and playing with children this is also an art <laughs> so you can imagine the variety of arts and uh, the kind of skills that were mentioned in the ancient texts okay so this is just to give an overview of the kalas now i'll come to the fees that was in the ancient education system the generally there was no fixed fees the pupil was charged uh, i mean according to their capacity and they could give whatever they had uh, according to manu a student should not pay any fees to his teacher before he finishes his education this is unthinkable today <laughs> that only after you finish your education you will pay something as guru dakshina okay uh, then there was a separation of upadhyay and acharya and acharya was someone who taught the vedas and with the 
Kalpa Sutra and Upanishads without charging fees. Uh, whereas an Upadhyaya was somebody who could take a, a, a something for his livelihood as a profession he would teach. And also the fees was given in different forms. Like you could, somebody could give uh, whatever they could afford. They could give uh, cows or uh, umbrella or shoes or uh, some uh, food items, you know. So vegetables or clothes as they could afford. Okay. Now I'll come to the different types of education that was given at that time. The Which will cover uh, different types of partshalas and gurukus at that time. So... Vedic education was one kind of education that was given. In this, this was a study of the Vedas. And to do this, uh, there was a special discipline, a specific discipline and a specific pedagogy that was enforced uh, to ensure that the students would develop their consciousness in a manner to be able to imbibe the Vedic learning. This pedagogy included the practice of yoga, jap meditation, living in a serene atmosphere and to imbibe the inward method of the Guru, the secrets of his efficiency and the spirit of his life and work. Without this system, without this discipline, it was not possible to imbibe the teachings of the Vedas. So if you wanted to go for a study in the Vedas, then you had to follow a certain kind of lifestyle, a certain kind of discipline and some rituals the, the fame of this is a famous step of the th three series step of pedagogy shravan manan and nididhyasan a series of three steps in which first you listen and then you reflect on the words of the guru and then you meditate so this is how you realize the knowledge according to kautilya this was uh, there's a different series of steps so shusha shravanam grahanam dharanam upa uha poho vigyan tattva abhinivesh which is the final step or comprehension of truth the education of brahmins was different from the education of other people for example the brahmins were taught subjects such as uh, veda itihas puran lexicography prosody phonology and various other things I will not go into the detail. This is a uh, the Buddhist text Milindapana gives a long list of subjects for the study of Brahmins. The education of Kshatriyas or princes was of a different nature because they had to study different subjects. For them, it was important to know uh, the art of war, currency. They also were taught arithmetic, music, medicine, archery. So they were taught various different sciences. According to Kautilya, the education of a prince uh, was he had to receive military training relating to the operation of the different elements of the army such as elephants, horses, chariots and weapons of war. He also had to study history or itihas which included the Purans, the Itivrit, the Akhyayeka and the Udharan and Dharmshastras and also the Arthshastra. Industrial education, as I have earlier pointed out, was different from the education for princes and education for Brahmins. In industrial education, you had to do something which we can today call as an apprenticeship. So you have to go to the workshop of the master and study with the master. The student had to live with his master whose home is his workshop and is to be treated and instructed by the master as his son. He is not to be exploited and employed on work not connected with his chosen craft. He cannot leave his master before the stipulated period of apprenticeship. An apprentice deserting a master not lacking in character or as a, as a teacher deserves corporal punishment. At the end of the pupilage, the apprentice must reward his master as best as he can. So this is just to give you an overview of the rules that were in place for people who were, for students who wished to train under a master as for any particular skill. Now, to give an idea about the kind of education system in the ancient days, I'll give you glimpses of 
the kind of quotations that we have from foreign travelers who came to india in the ancient time there was one traveler called i singh he came to india from between 635 and 713 ce and he said in india he said that there are two traditional ways by which one can attain to great power intellectual power first is by repeatedly committing to memory the intellect is developed secondly the alphabet fixes one's ideas and then he says something very interesting he says indians can often commit to memory whatever they have once heard he says i have not been uh, i have myself met some such men who can memorize anything they have been told once so they don't forget anything once you tell them something they'll always remember throughout their life they cannot forget this is itself quite an amazing thing another foreign traveler who visited india around the same time was shuan zang and he wrote about the education that was given at that time in the university of nalanda that flourished in today which is today modern bihar he talked about the different subjects there is shabd vidya there is shilp sthan vidya then chikitsa vidya so he talked about various kinds of subjects that were taught at the nalanda university at that time shuan zang also mentions hetu vidya the science of causes he talks about adhyatma vidya then he says the brahmin study the four ved shastra and then he he gives an account of the various subjects that the brahmins and others were studying at that time now we jump to the modern period the 17th century and we have a european account a european traveler by the name pietro della vel and he tells us that he saw little boys learning arithmetic outside a temple and the manner of learning arithmetic was very interesting he says that each of them repeat one after the other and in musical notes so you know mathematics at that time was learned in a very interesting way there was musical notes and you could memorize the tables mathematical tables using musical notes this is uh, described very beautifully by uh, uh, d senthil babu in a paper on the tamil tamil tinnai schools in which he says that how you can learn mathematics using music so he uh, this fellow this european traveler was looking at these boys learning arithmetic outside a temple and he says that they were not using paper they were only using finger on the ground and they were making these calculations and they were doing this so after the first one after the first student had written what he sang then he the rest the remaining also sang along with him and wrote down the same thing so for example they say 2 by 2 makes 4 you know and 3 by 3 makes 9 and they were learning the mathematical tables so what he did was he asked one of them that what if you get it wrong so they said that he said i asked them if they happened to forget or be mistaken in any part of the lesson then who corrected them and who taught them they they being all scholars without the assistance of any master they answered me and said true it was not possible for all four of them to forget or to mistake in the same part and that they thus exercised together to the end that if one happened to be out the others might correct him and this indeed is a pretty easy and secure way of learning this was observed by pietra delovel okay so now i'll come i'll give you a brief overview of the institutions that were flourishing in india in the ancient period uh, we all know about takshashila which was then the capital of gandhar which is in present day afghanistan and one of the famous teachers graduates of takshashila is anybody knows kautilya he graduated from takshashila somebody whom we also known as chanakya then uh, we have these accounts of various chinese travelers from fahi and yun sang ai sing who describe these buddhist monasteries and particularly the famous monastery the university of nalanda which at that time housed more than 3000 monks and valla bhi we know uh, these unfortunately these universities were destroyed by invaders um, bakhtiyar khalji destroyed 
Nalanda. He, he said to have burnt Nalanda and it, it is said to have burnt for days together. Such a huge library. In 1197, uh, it was destroyed by Bhaktiar Khalji. So, these are just sketches of what these great centers would have looked like. Nalanda, Takshashila, Vikram Shila, Vallabhi in Gujarat. So, these are just some of the centers. There were so many. As is just to give you a glimpse of these institutions. Now, I have given you a brief overview of the history of education in India and about the kind of ancient education system. I will now come to education in the modern period. What are the challenges? What is the current situation? So, in the modern period, you must have heard of somebody called Macaulay. He's now very well known or rather quite infamous now. So, he was a British official. He was also part of the uh, Committee of Public Instruction at that time in India. And he, was, he played a key role in shaping India's education policy as we know it today. So, his mission was very clear and simple. His mission was to create a class of Indians who would be Indian in blood, but English in culture. So, to do that, what would they have to do? They would have to learn European texts, not Indian texts. They would have to acquire European knowledge, not Indian knowledge. They would have to learn secular textbooks, not anything to do with religious textbooks. So, no Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Puran, all of these were kept out of the syllabus. They would have to be governed by a centralized bureaucracy which would control the instruction that they would, they would be given. They would have to follow the English calendar. So the holidays would not be given on the festivals. No holiday on Purnima or Amasya. Earlier the schools had holiday on every Purnima. All the Patshalas and Gurukuls were closed on every Purnima of every month. Or also on all the festivals of course. But now we don't have that because we are following the English calendar. This was the kind of system that Macaulay envisioned and yes, it got implemented because of the British rule and over the last 100-200 years, we have been following in a sense the system that enables us to have a European knowledge and a European taste in everything and we are cut off from our roots and we have become self-alienated self to the extent that we don't know our texts, we don't know our knowledge systems. Today we talk about a subject, introducing a subject called Indian knowledge system. This in fact, this, this fact itself testifies to the fact that we don't know our Indian knowledge system, that we are in a situation that we have to introduce a subject called Indian knowledge system in our curriculum. Because we don't have Indian knowledge system in our curriculum. Now, in recent past, only the government has, in the recent education policy, they have come up with a provision to have Indian knowledge system as a subject in generally all institutions. And they have set up a, a center for Indian knowledge systems. But this is now, in 2022, after more than 200 years of uh, Macaulay and after so many, 70, more than 70 years of being independent. The reason is that we were self-alienated. We got cut off from our roots. We don't, we don't know our knowledge systems. We don't know our texts. We don't know that Bodhayan's uh, Sulba Sutras had the, the so-called Pythagoras theorem much, much before Pythagoras. And I can give you so many examples of so many texts that had very elaborate knowledge systems before the Europeans discovered them, but we don't know about it because we are not taught those texts. Yet, our traditional education somehow continues despite this Macaulay framework. And this is a very interesting quote by Kapil Kapoorji because I'm, I'm, I'm using this quote because this I can use this to now talk about my ongoing research work. He says that we find that the central purpose of the Hindu education system is still the same though not explicitly recognized or supported in today's government-sponsored system of education. 
The Guru Shishya Parampara still exists, and Indian knowledge systems and men of knowledge exist chiefly outside the mainstream Macaulayan framework. So he says that we still have Guru Shishya Parampara, but it is not recognized by the state because the state is still largely uh, following a legacy of the colonial rule. And then, uh, if we want to be true architects of our future, we must understand our past. That's why it is relevant to study the Indian education system and to study the history of Indian education. Okay. Uh, with this quote on the uh, existence of parallel Guru Shishya Paramparas in our education system, which is not recognized, I will now come to my research work because my research work is focusing on studying the existing Guru Shishya Paramparas and the remaining traditional systems that are in place, educational systems that have not been covered and they have, that have not been highlighted by the mainstream histories of education. So I'll first talk about, I'll first give you an overview of my uh, PhD thesis before I talk about my current research projects. My doctoral research was on the DAV schools. The DAV schools were started in Punjab. The, they were started in 1886 by the Arya Samaj in Lahore. And the reason to start the DAV schools was to give an education that would be both Anglo and Vedic. So it would be, <coughs> this was a compromise because they had to be, they wanted to be recognized by the government. But they also wanted to give Vedic education. So they said Anglo-Vedic is a ni nice sort of compromise. But the reason I studied this, this movement was to understand the kind of education enterprise that Indians could develop independently and on their own without the support of government. At that time, this was a very big thing. Because to defy the existing, to have to develop an alternative to colonial education, you had to have a vision and then you had to have resources to implement that. So this was the first such movement, such indigenous movement, which started an alternative to colonial education. By the 20th century, the DAV movement came to be seen as a paragon of self-reliance and self-reliant educational enterprise. It was by 1916, the DAV was the most popular institution. Every fourth student in Lahore was enrolled in a DAV school. So you can imagine the popularity of the DAV school Lahore at that time. It was the most popular school in India. Uh, my PhD thesis was highlighting the different kinds of uh, education models that were followed by the AV system, in particular the kind of traditional and modern learning that was given and how they managed to mix both traditional and modern learning. Some of the questions that my PhD thesis looked at was what were the modern aspects of the DAV movement, what were the traditional aspects, in what way can we call this movement modern and traditional at the same time. So basically to understand how they were managing to stay afloat by doing a mix of both tradition and modernity. How the language was taught. So there are many sub questions also in this. Now the gaps in the literature were that there was no account of the DAV movement earlier. That was one thing which motivated me also to write this. There was no historical account. We have several tracts, but we don't have any existing account of the DAV movement. Another thing was that the case studies which were done on indigenous institutions were mostly done with, a, with an agenda. So they were looking at some agendas. For example, there were studies done, done by uh, on the Gurukul Kangadi or on the on lessons from uh, on the, some schools of Banaras. But these studies were looking at these institutions from a political agenda, as if 
all indigenous institutions were started only to fulfill a political agenda that was the reason why i started undertaking this research because my objective was not to look at the political agenda of these institutions my objective was to look at the kind of education they were giving and whether they were able to revive traditional learning to an extent in the colonial setup in the colonial world the whereas the existing literature only focused on nationalism or religious consciousness and all that whereas i wanted to understand the kind of uh, traditional revival and the continuities that existed if any between indigenous patshalas that we have been studying earlier and then the dav movement i used various kinds of sources for my study i used colonial archives government proceedings census reports gazetteers uh, especially available at the national archives of india i used institutional records of the dav movement in hindi and english these i found in the nehru memorial and museum library in delhi i accessed original textbooks in hindi that were used in the dav schools at that time and these i got some of them i got from uh, i got from the university of chicago and some of them i got from the dav uh, pratinidhi sabhas in different places i refer to arya samaj literature in hindi and english i also refer to newspaper reports in english these again i found in the nehru memorial and museum library in delhi so using a wide range of sources i studied the nature of the dav movement and to what extent was it traditional and to what extent it was modern uh research findings yeah so there were different modern aspects i found of the dav movement for example they had a centralized control they had uh institutional records which were modern in the sense that our patshalas did not have any such records earlier uh they had a system of standardized curriculum and examination and religious instruction for the first time was introduced as a separate discipline in the dav schools but the dav schools were also traditional because they were using hindi and sanskrit as the medium of instruction they were not using english as the medium of instruction and they were using traditional arithmetic also it was traditional also in the sense that it was community driven the funding was driven by the community it was not being given they were not being given grants by any centralized agency then they were using methods of indigenous that were used in indigenous patshalas such as yoga pranayam and they used to do sandhya sandhya upasana they used to do every morning and evening which was again a part of the traditional setup so the dav movement was traditional in many ways and it was also modern in some ways so this was a kind of uh uh research findings that i found from my study and then there were different inferences that can be drawn from this okay so with this i will end the discussion on my own research work my phd work and to give you a glimpse of the kind of work that i am doing right now uh it is in continuation with my quest to understand the indigenous education system so i looked at the dav movement and i studied the kind of indigenous features that it had and currently i am working on understanding the indigenous gurukuls and patshalas that are still flourishing in india and have been flourishing since the last 100 or 200 years so normally what happens is that any mainstream history of education textbook or any history of education book will tell you only about the expansion of english education and colonial education in india in the last 100 or 200 years but no history of education will tell you about the various gurukuls that have flourished in india in the last 100 years that is that is entirely missing from our narrative of education we don't have that focus on the traditional setup in our education narrative itself 
so only once we bring that back the focus on our traditional education system then only we can start talking about how to revive it and how to reincorporate uh, indian knowledge systems in our curriculum so that much i'll say right now and uh, <laughs> i hope to uh, bring out a book manuscript in the next 6 uh, months or 1 year now i'll talk about our education policy our education policy and obviously this is connected to the future of social sciences because this is also a topic that was for discussion today uh, our education policy has many references to the fact that there is a need it emphasizes again and again that there is a need for our education system to be rooted and grounded in the indian ethos and indian culture in the indian local context so that students can relate to it there are repeatedly there are references to this in our latest education policy so our new education policy was launched in 2020 and this has many interesting changes another important feature which is again repeatedly mentioned in our education policy is the focus on multidisciplinary studies we must have interdisciplinary studies that is another feature another focus of our education policy and this is again something which is a requirement of the 21st century also this is mentioned repeatedly in several passages on uh, when we talk about higher education then also it is mentioned in so many passages about how you need to have a collaborative approach you cannot have hard separation between humanities and sciences and you cannot have any segregate disciplines also i want to finally end this lecture by talking about a myth that was prevalent in the uh, in in much of our common popular discourse Uh, until very recently and that was the myth about the left brain and the right brain right brain because this has an impact on the uh, the use of interdisciplinary studies that our education policy talks about so earlier people used to think even scientists used to think in the 19th century that there are two kinds of people one are those who are left brained and one are those who are right brained so because the brain has two hemispheres left and right and the generally the functioning of the left hemisphere uh, relates to rational thought scientific thought logical inquiry and uh, mathematics so and, and the right hemisphere of the brain generally functions uh, uh, i mean the general functions are relating to uh, creativity arts and imagination so it was assumed that scientists are left brained and artists are right brained that was the original assumption of of people in fact it was so popular there is this book by robert stevenson dr jekyll and mr hyde that also uh, analyze this reinforces these stereotypes this was so popular in our discourse that we have this left brain people and right brain people and they are two separate people but recent research has shown us that this is a myth there are no separate divisions as such i mean there are different functions but it is not that they function separately so for example when you perform a task your left brain and right brain are working together they are not working separately when you look at a picture your some part of a brain will look at the abstractness of that painting and some part of your brain will simultaneously be looking at the larger contours of the painting so when you look at anything when you do any task even when you perform a mathematical task both your left and right brain are working together your left brain is working on the calculation or your right brain is working on the comparisons so it is a myth that the left brain and right brain are mutually exclusive the left brain and right brain are not mutually exclusive they are working together and the larger significance of this uh, of the, of this the larger inference of this is that our rational minds and our artistic minds are not two separate minds we are not two separate selves there is no separate rational self in us and no separate emotional or artistic self in us they are both working at the same time in everything we do 
in every even a judge who has to make a judgment is at the same time rational and emotional there is no separation between reason and emotion and no even in the brain there is no separation when we do anything we are doing we are using all the faculties together which means again it brings us to this question that why do we have then a separation between the study of science and the study of humanities or the any artistic study for for that matter when our body and mind are equipped to be able to study and to do any task using all our faculties simultaneously why is our education system not designed in such a manner that we are using all our faculties at the same time why do we have a separation between arts and sciences or between rational and logical studies and uh, you know artistic studies this is going to go away now in the 21st century and the education policy is insisting on this particular framework now because they say that there is now a need the education policy repeatedly emphasizes the need for multidisciplinary approach to learning and i will end my lecture by saying that there are so many examples of the greatest innovators of the 20th century who have been working at the intersection of humanities and and sciences Steve Jobs for example could not have designed the Macintosh if he would not have training in both sciences and arts he had that freedom and that range of learning that enabled him to develop that capacity to design that in fact <clears throat> many of you should know this that uh Steve Jobs he dropped out of college but he only attended one course on calligraphy and he used that he used that calligraphy to design the fonts but he was also a, a technician who could be more technical than steve jobs who could design an operating system so is would you call him an artist or would you call him a scientist this is just one example innovation will come at the intersection of humanities and sciences thank you